question? Oh. Brilliant. Yes, thank you. Thank you. So good morning, everyone uh, who's here and also virtually. Uh, my name is Anu Kamlasaran. I am a, a radiologist working in Lanarkshire. I've got head and neck and pediatric interests. Um, I have been given 20 minutes. I'll try to keep the time. And because of that, I'm going to whisk through the first bits, which is epidemiology and thyroid malignancy, because I'm not going to say anything new. We pick up new things. Outcome is not that changed. You know what the thyroid uh, malignancies mainly are. They are the ones that come from the follicular cells, which are your papillary and your follicular. And then you have your C-cell uh, cancers, which uh, is your medullary. And then you have your anaplastic, which the behaves the way it wants to. Um, and you have lymphomas and metastases. Uh, metastases are rare, but you can get them uh, basically commonly from breast uh, lung, RCC, melanoma sometimes as well. The um, Just about 50 to 70% of people walking the road will have a thyroid nodule. Majority of them are benign. Majority of them are degenerative nodular hyperplasias. Uh, there's a small percentage will be, which will be malignant. Uh, the, although there are different modalities available to look at thyroid, the main way of looking at thyroid is ultrasound, and that's what I'm going to talk about. As radiologists, when we are asked to look at ultrasounds, we have guidances coming from everywhere. And we know when there is more than one guidance, it means we don't know exactly what we are doing and we are kind of trying to figure out the best way forward. Um, in our uh, department, we follow uh, BTA guideline, that is your use coding. Um, I was trained using the use score, so if I see a thyroid nodule, my mind immediately goes to the use score and I either grade it as a benign, I don't touch it, Malignant, I have to touch it, and you, I end up touching it anyway, depending on realistic medicine, obviously, are, they, are we going to do anything, is there neck note, so on and so forth. In 2017, we had the ACR Tyrat system, which is useful if you don't, uh, depending on your resources, actually, it, if you don't have enough people who will need it, but you have enough people who will look at it, then it, it gives you a better a way of following these patients up without them getting lost in the system. Um, and they, they are supposedly meant to reduce uh, the your number of intervention and, uh, and increase your diagnostic accuracy. Now, what uh, Tyrats does, in, uh, which is slightly separate to or different from U scoring, is it looks at the size. U scoring does not look at the size. We don't care how big it is. It is the morphology we look at in U score. I say we, but you know, U score. Um, whereas Tyrats look at the size, um, and it also looks at the uh, the growth pattern. Um, vascularity is not looked at, whereas vascularity is something that U score looks at. What we do in Tyrats is you give points. Points for composition, points for ecogenicity, shape, margin, and presence of ecogenic fossae. Once you have these points, you join them together, and then you look at the size. Then you decide, am I going to FNA? Am I going to um, buy up, um, follow it up? I think that answers one of the questions that was asked previously about the tyrides too, with a small nodule. It all depends on your scoring and the size. Uh, as far as ACR goes, uh, as far as U scoring goes, it depends on your local guidelines. We have a Western Scotland guidelines which says if it's less than one centimeter, then it has to be a clinical decision whether we need we FNA it or not. So these are two images, uh, the one here that is your CT and the one on the right is your ultrasound. Uh, regardless of CT or ultrasound, the uh, thyroid should be homogeneous. It should not have any kind of um, hyper or hypo or isoechoic nodules in it. This is a normal thyroid. Now what happens in an abnormal thyroid? So composition basically is what is that nodule made of? Is it cystic? Is it solid cystic or is it solid? Those are the only things it can be. It can have things in it, but the composition basically is these three things. If it is cystic, that means it's got nothing in it, just water. It allows the ultrasound waves to go through, then it's got get a z uh, score of zero. Spongiform is we were taught when uh, in, in U scoring is if it's a spongiform nodule with colloid, ignore it. And it is a it is given a zero here as well, quite rightly. Now spongiform means uh, around 50% or less than the nodule is made up of tiny cells. There is always, now uh, this is very interesting for me when I read the uh, ACR uh, paper, is spongiform looking nodules, but which has got more solid in them are considered solid. And they are given a score of two. Now having said that, as it goes down the route, you will realize if that's the only thing, they get a score of two and then that's it, they're okay. 
um, mix solid cystic regardless of uh, content num vol volume of your solid or uh, vascularity because they don't look at vascularity at all um, they are given a score of one so immediately your thinking capacity is taken out of the equation and you say mix solid cystic one that's it done you don't have to think about it anymore now, obviously, solid means solid. It's m more than 50% uh, of solid stuff. Now, ecogenicity. Now you've decided what is the composition. Then you have to look at the ecotexture. Ecotexture basically means you're comparing it to something. What are you comparing it to? To the thyroid uh, gland. And the thyroid gland, if it's less um, brighter or darker than the thyroid gland, but so do dark as if there is nothing in it but water that is called anechoic. Anechoic structures will allow um, the uh, the ultrasound waves uh, to go through them. So they have posterior acoustic enhancement. You can see there is brightness behind. So that is posterior acoustic enhancement. And that is a sign of anechogenicity. We always put color on to see there is no flow, flow within it as well. Now look at this one. This is isoechoic, it looks similar echogenicity to the uh, adjacent thyroid. Now, somebody might say, oh, is it really, is it a, not a little bit hyper? Doesn't matter, you get a score of one, okay? Now, hypoechoic means, is it, whenever you see something that is less than the thyroid, that is when your brain should kick in to say, is it less than the thyroid? In which case, it's given a score of two, or is it even more darker than the overlying strap muscles? In which case, it is given a score of three. More uh, in use scoring, also more uh, darker than the strap muscles means that it is more likely to malignant, and it is given a U of five. So once you have decided that, that is added to your scoring, and then you go on to your next bit. Your next bit is shape. Anyone who's ever worked in breast will know that there is the, the this the strong propounders of belief that wider, th taller than wide lesions are malignant. Now there is a portion who does not believe in that as a gospel truth, but this uh, th there's been studies which has proved there's a Kim's a study by Kim et al. which says that 93% specificity for malignancy. If your lesion in the axial plane is taller than wide, the reasoning behind this is that the tumor grows in a kind of centrifugal uh, fugal fashion. So in in for the ACR tyrants, you give taller than wide gets a, wider than tall gets a zero. If it's basically tall, it gets three. Margins. Margins I find very, very, very tricky. And it used to be that ill-defined margins, we had a different understanding of ill-defined margins, or we thought our ill-defined margins separately in U scoring. Uh, now, in Tyrats, they're very clear and their lexicon says, um, if you have a smooth margin, and if you see this black line around it, that's the halo that we used to call in your U score. And the halo is because of uh, fibro, uh, fibrous tissue, um, infil inflammatory infiltrates, and pushed kind of squished thyroid around it. And if you put color on, that is the thing that would be bright up a little bit. Um, so if it's a smooth, clean uh, margin, it gives a score of zero. Ill-defined here means that you cannot take a pencil and draw around that lesion. It's kind of merging in an isoechoic with the thyroid glands. So that is given a score of zero and it's a, it's a sign of benignity that has to be separated from the irregular a lobulated mass. Now, this is a lobulated mass. You can see it's got lobules. It's sticking out the way. It's sticking into the tissue. And you can also have speculated mass, which is hypoechoic, and little hypoechoic strands are going into the thyroid. And they are given a higher score of two. Exothyroidal extension always is nasty, and uh, it is given a score of three. Now, the problem with the thyroid, extrathyroid extension is it's difficult to see on ultrasound sometimes. Your ultrasound is only as good as your ultrasonographer, whoever they are. And if they uh, don't drop the depth enough, if they don't look at the uh, adjacent um, uh, tissues, including your strap muscles, it can be, very, even, even if you are good, it's very difficult to miss, whereas on CT, it's right there. Having said that, if you have extrathyroidal extension, there is no way you've touched that neck and you've missed it. That neck would be really firm. Echogenic foci. So now we've dealt with three things. Now we've come to the fourth, that is echogenic foci. Now you look inside the component on, and, and what is happening inside that nodule, and you look to see if there are bright flecks. Now, this is the one bit where you get can get more than one score. You can get a score of zero to a score of three, and you can have a nodule which may have zero, one, two, and three. So you, you can get high scores, low scores, and you add them all together and make the one score. So let's look at how it looks. So, so this is 
a uh, cystic nodule. It's got septations in it. At some point, it may have had bleeding into it. It have low level echoes, which kind of sediments when you when the patient is moving. Uh, then you have something called the peripheral rim calcification. It's commonly seen in multinodal agoita. In uh, U scoring, we gave it the importance only if the calcifications were disrupted or you could see tissue poking through it. Disrupted calcification implies that there is something growing within it and it's making it bigger. So the calcifications which were formed are now disrupted. And sometimes you can see tissue poking out. That used to be given a higher score in U scoring. Whereas here, peripheral rim calcification, don't think too much, give it a two. Now, echogenic fossae. I've got uh, three echogenic fossae in the bottom. Uh, can you see me moving my thing? Oh, you can't. Can I use this? Might not, might not. Oh, doesn't matter. The one which says colloid, right? Uh, on that, you can see there's colloid reverberation artifacts. There's a bright rim, small, less brighter, less brighter. It's almost like a comet tail. So that's your comet tail artifact. And now what ACR Tyrat says is, if you have a comet tail, which is less than one millimeter, you have to give it a score. We used to call everything comet tail, but now we have to call, give that a score if you're using ACR tie rats. Now, the punctate and dystrophic calcifications, you can have little punctate dots. Uh, they are some homobodies from uh, um, uh, papillary cancer. If you see punctate calcification, inevitably you're thinking papillary cancer. Uh, you can also have dystrophic calcification, what appears to be dystrophic calcification, then you give that a score as well. And that brings up your score together. Now, once you have all of this, you have uh, a score of say um, eight or nine or two even, then you look at the size. And depending on the size, you then go on to decide, are you going to FNA now? Are you going to follow up? And at the time of follow up, then again, you have to reassess the whole thing and decide, are you going to FNA now? Are you going to follow up? Now, t uh, if you have a lesion that's less than 0.5, and that feeds into the other question from previous, if you have a, a, a nodule of less than five millimeters, I suppose all of this is irrelevant because you're not meant to do anything about it because studies say that it's unlikely to become a significant abnormality anyway. So less than five millimeters are not touched. Um, for and, and five millimeter lesions, FNA, your outcome chances of finding a good pathology is very, very small anyway. Um, and also you look at the growth pattern during the course of your follow-up. And if at five years uh, it's stable, then no follow-up. So basically this is a tyrad score. And I uh, have sent a little thing with um, uh, with Jed to share with, uh, with those who are doing it virtually, but this is my way of saving the planet. I was thinking to print out, but my 15 year old told me, please don't be a dinosaur, do this. You can uh, take that and it, it it leads up to it. So there you go. I've been called a dinosaur as well. So uh, this is basically, uh, if, you, if you keep that and use the first page, and then we look at the rest of the, I've got a few cases, we can look at that. So what are the features of malignancy? Uh, you've got a lobulated outline going extensively inside uh, or, or, or um, uh, going out with of the uh, thyroid. Um, if you have microcalcifications, even in small lesions, microcalcifications uh, have got a higher specificity. Uh, coarse calcifications are usually seen in medullary cancers. So if you see medullary cancers, um, then if, uh, uh, calcification. And if you see them everywhere, there's probably nothing. But if you see them in the nodule, that is when you're worried about it. Lymph nodes are very, very, very important. Um, on CT, lymph nodes may be um, picked up only if there's morphological difference or if they have a size problem. Whereas in ultrasound, even tiny little things can be picked up. And we look at your, uh, your um, uh, lymph node and the lymph node should be nice and oblong. It should have a fatty hilum and the fat fatty hilum should have blood flow through it. The germinal matrix should be nice and clean. Um, and if you have that, then that's a normal lymph node. You can forget it and walk away. If it is not, then you will have these kind of lymph nodes, which is on a spectrum. The one on the left shows a little bit of brightness in the cortex. Um, you know that is not right, regardless of the size of it, regardless of the oblongness of it, uh, that is not right. Um, the, the one next to it has got a heterogeneous cortex uh, and it's got cystic lesions in it. The one next to it is a cyst. Now, if you see something like that, you have a, a, a tendency to say, oh, maybe it is a branchial cleft cyst. Branchial cleft cysts 
yes, they are common, but in an adult, if you see a branchial cleft cyst, especially over the age of 8, 25, 30, um, while that is in your differential, it's not the top. You have to think about cystic uh, malignancy, cystic metastases. Um, uh, the biggest one is papillary. Papillary cancer, if you look at the CT there, their lymph nodes can be very, very, very cystic. Um, you can also have necrotic lymph nodes, but usually necrotic lymph nodes, the periphery is very thick. You've got a thick cortex, whereas branchial cleft cysts usually have a nice thin cortex. Um, then the one along that on the extreme right it has got little flecks of brightness in it. And so they are papillary metastases. Does not want to go forward? Yeah. So this is what we use at the moment um, because it works for us. Uh, there is talks about moving into ACR tie rats because we have more sonographers who will do that but will not intervene. We've got, uh, um, so skill mixes, wherever you have skill mixes, you have to think of ways of using your skill mix to the best of your ability. So you are using um, what you have to do the absolute best that you can have. So I, I'm sure there are, people from different parts of the world who will be using different things. Um, and there is, at this point of time, I don't think there is a right or wrong. So we have talked about halo and I have talked about vascularity. So basically that is it. And time-wise, I think we are maybe okay for time. Okay, so let's look at a few cases just to reiterate some points. So this is a case um, that came with a firm mass in the neck. Th this person was a malignancy even before they came to us. Uh, it, basically what the, the clinician wanted was us to needle it, see if the nodes are involved, do a staging. Because even as they felt the neck, it's like, yep, this is a malignancy. So when we do the, the ultrasound, B, uh, BTA score, U scoring, it's a U5. It's got a regular hypoechoic. This is your strap muscle right there. I wish I could show you the on top. And you can see it's darker than the strap muscle. Uh, and those bright flecks, that is your uh, microcalcifications. And as soon as you see that, you're thinking papillary cancer in your head, and you can see it is actually going out with the thyroid as well. So obviously you're going to needle it. You can choose to needle your primary or your uh, lymph node, depending on what's easy. If I think it is a papillary cancer, I needle the primary. If I think it is, it could be something different, like maybe a lymphoma, then I needle both. Um, because I'm a wuss, I don't like to core thyroids. I only FNA thyroids, but I will core ne uh, necks. So if it's a lymphoma, I'll FNA the thyroid and core the neck, uh, neck node. So the, the thyroid says it's a solid, so it's given a two. It's very hypoechoic. It's given a three shape. I couldn't make out the shape in this one. It, it was everywhere. So shape is only where you can actually make out the shape. The infiltrative ones, so what do you give it? I gave it a zero. Um, Extrathyroidal extension, yes. So it was a three. Echogenic fossa, it was a three. So it was a TR11. No questions about it. Regardless of, you don't even have to sit and count the numbers. You're going to needle it. So there you go. And yes, that was right. There was proved to be, FNA showed it was a papillary cancer. Uh, whooped it out and that's what it showed. Now this is a firm mass in the neck. Um, uh, uh, Jay showed an even nicer one, uh, but this is the one that we got. Um, and it was very hypoechoic, very infiltrated. If you look at this, it's almost homogeneously hypoechoic. There is no kind of bits to it that is, okay, yeah, all right, you can see a bit of brightness here and there, but not like the other one. It is like a bland tissue. And when I looked at the neck nodes, the neck nodes, they had a bit of a central fatty hilum, but the germinal matrix was hypoechoic and juicy. You see that and you think, yes, all right, fine, you can have papillary, but you have to think uh, lymphoma in that case. Uh, and if you look at the CT, that CT is like somebody took a paintbrush and did a rrr, rrr, rrr. So that is typical for lymphoma. So in this case, we did an FNA of the neck, uh, the, the primary thyroid lesion, and uh, core, the neck node, the core was the one that clinched the diagnosis. Um, and tyrads, you can absolutely tyrads, especially if you have sonographers who are training in this, they can be trained into tyrads. They will reach the same place. They will reach the place where they say we need to put a needle in it. Now, case three. Uh, this is this is this is the thing where we struggle, pathologists struggle, and you end up having to do a excisional biopsy, which would be at a, a partial uh, thyroidectomy or hemithyroidectomy. So this is a lesion, hypoechoic, 
hypoechoic ones, unfortunately, rarely ever or if never actually gets put into a benign thing. They're either U3 or up. Um, it's got a halo, which is good. It had peripheral vascularity, which is good. It has no punctate fossae. Mm, it has no comet tail artifact, which again, uh, so you, you're either calling it a U3 or U4, depending on your um, your way of calling it more than anything. Um, so if we tie rats it, this is where tie rats becomes actually useful. Uh, if you tie rats it, um, it's a solid of two. It's a uh, hypo equal, it gets two again. It's wide, so it gets a zero. It's got a smooth margin, gets a zero. It has no echogenic process, it gets a zero. It's a tie rats four. So tyrides four. If you look back at the little thing that I've sent you, uh, you will you can see a, a, you you're going to F and A anyway. So the size made a difference here. If it was a smaller one, you could have followed it up. But since it is a bigger one, ended up F and A now. Ended up F and A. We know, and uh, it is going to be a difficult one for the pathologist as well. That came back with a type three F, and I know all the surgeons will be like type three F. Oh well, we have no choice. If it's a young patient, uh, goes on to have a hemithyroidectomy. Unless things have changed, and you guys don't do it. It turned out to be an endometoid nodule, but in this case, we were pushed into a corner. We had no choice but to do this. Case four is a solid cystic lesion. You can see bright flecks outside the uh, the thyroid as well, and that's colloid reverberation. It's just the way I've taken the picture. It looks doesn't look quite like colloid reverberation um, here and there, but there are multiple nodules with colloid reverberation. This is a little solid cystic nodule. It has no vascularity. I would ignore it completely in the U two uh, in the uh, in the U scoring. Tyrats says the same thing. Gives it a score of two. Again, don't follow it up um, and, and ignore it. Spongiform nodules. That is that that is that is very interesting. Um, if I saw that uh, and I was scoring it, I'd give a U two. No follow up. That's it. Done and dusted. And it depends on who is calling the tyrats. If you look at the lexicon, you have you have the the you can have spongiform looking nodules, but if the solid elements are more, they tend to call it solid and give it a score. Um, I've called it spongiform because that is spongiform. Um, and echogenicity, it's isoechoic, so that gets a one. Uh, it's taller than wide. It's taller than wide just because of the way it grew, not because of its its malignant. And this patient, this was more than, it was at the beginning of my career, uh, so near, near about in eight, nine, 10 years ago, and nothing's happened to this person. Uh, so it's isoechoic. Um, shape is, the shape is, has given a higher score, but is it really a higher score? I question that. Um, Ill-defined margins, again, zero. Uh, he's got common tail artifact. That's a zero. But he's got common tail that is um, less than a millimeter. So you're forced to give it a score. So depending on who's scoring it, um, you may get a score of seven, in which case you have to look at the size and then F and A or follow up and then so on and so forth. Um, so the, the, this is where you have to use your clinical judgment, your combined assimilated knowledge, ha speak with your clinician, um, have a plan of what you're going to do. Um, and you cannot be technicians who are filling in scores and doing things by scores. Um, and I think that is one of the one of the places where I think a radiologist can make a difference to management. There are pitfalls as with anything else, and I think my timing is maybe nearly very nearly over. So uh, pitfalls are um, if you have thyroiditis, thyroiditis makes your thyroid very kind of uh, heterogeneous, hypoechoic, looks a little bit meh. Um, so if you have an infiltrative disease, which does not have margins, it can look very similar. So you have, you've got two pictures. Which one is the thyroiditis? Which one is the malignancy? The one on the left is the malignancy. One on the right is the thyroiditis. So thyroiditis can look and mimic. So you have to, uh, again, this is where your uh, clinical acumen, you're speaking to the patient, your your surgeon's idea of what it is, and all of this comes together. If this thing comes with a node, that's it. Jobs are good and you can do it. Yeah. Microcalcification. This is a, a case that I had. Um, it's a U5. Oh, looking at it, it's got a nodular outline. It's very, very hypoechoic. It's got bright flex. Uh, it's a U5. And you tyrads it, that gives you a tyrads of eight. And it was more than a centimeter, so you have an eight. Now, usually, if you have this, you are almost never going to get a path which says anything other than, yeah, this is not good. 
you can occasionally get it if it's a very small lesion, but not at this size. You, we got a 3A path, which was a bit, should have probably warned us, eh, something is not right. Anyway, the patient went on to have a hemithyroidectomy. It was an adenomatoid nodule, and there was that was a cholesterol granuloma. So these things are sent to trick us. So there, there is, no matter what we do, there is something that is always going to trip us up. So what we learn, have an open language uh, dialogue between all the teams so you can all work together to give the right treatment. Um, we use a uh, use scoring system with chats about going to the TIRATS, um, ACI TIRATS score. But I'd say choose a score that is relevant to you, your demographics, um, and your resources so that you can use it to the best possible uh, result that you can get. Practice realistic medicine. If you've got a 90 year old with a funny looking U3, I would say step back, um, but you know, ultimately you, everyone is their own boss. You can do what you want. Uh, U3, TR3 is tough on everyone. Um, we will, we, everyone struggles with that um, and that is life. Um, the perfect system is not there yet, but we can make do with what we have. And I think that is me at the end of it. I think I've kind of kept a time. So questions? I think there is a question. Could you explain the difference between the punctate and dystrophic calcifications? How do you differentiate them and their implications clinically? Aha. Thank you for the wonderful talk. I like it. I like that question. It's a very nice question. So uh, punctate basically means little small flecks of calcium. If you look behind the punctate calcium, there should be no posterior acoustic shadowing at all. So that's basically what it means that um, the ultrasound waves are allowed to pass through it because it's kind of Samoma bodies, isn't it? It's allowing it or it's so small, it makes no difference or discernible difference. Whereas dystrophic calcifications are... I don't know if I have dystrophic calcifications here. Oh, such a shame. Well, this black and white thing, dystrophic calcifications are calcium, bits of calcium that you can see within the nodule. And if you look behind it, and when I say look behind it, I mean, look at that region immediately posterior to the, let me find that and let me see if I can show you. This is the region behind it. Oh, oh, oh. Did it want it wanted immediately behind it so if you have dystrophic calcification there will be nothing behind it will be blackness behind it because it's uh, uh, reflecting everything back the difference um if you have echogenic calcification or punctate echogenic calcifications you are thinking uh papillary cancers because these are are in theory meant to be somoma bodies, which are part of the uh, the the papillary cancer. If I remember correctly, it is the papillary tip that necroses off and floats about. So that is that is if you see that that is high risk of malignancy. Dystrophic, you can have multinodular goiters with dystrophic calcification. And what does it mean? If you have a, 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 a hypoechoic lesion with the dystrophic calcification within it, then you are most likely to have a medullary carcinoma. If you have that along with calcified lymph nodes, that is most likely to be medullary carcinoma. So calcium on its own doesn't mean much. You have to look at it in the background of where the calcium is and is it calcium. And uh, there are the in in the beginning of my career, that is one of the things that 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 frustrated me the most. How do I separate between a tiny punctum of a uh, fleck of hyperechogenicity? And if it's not showing the reverberation, is it because it is not big enough to reverberate, or is it because it is it is a bit of uh, a punctate calcification? It's a difficult one, but ACI kind of puts to bed that one. I hope that answered that. Brilliant. One more question. Uh, latest guidelines suggest co-biopsy for type three A lesion initially diagnosed on FNAC. If you have the capacity to core, by all means core. I work in a DGH. I have no um, uh, 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 ENT surgeon on site. Uh, if I core a thyroid, you see the thing with coring is. Uh, you are going through, if you have a lesion in the periphery, you can core it, nothing will happen. If you've got a lesion in the center or deep, you are going through normal thyroid tissue to reach the, the mass. And you the risk of having a um, hematoma in the thyroid causing compromise to your, um, your, your, your you know, breathing is a possibility. It's a theoretical possibility, but it is a possibility. From a radiologist's point of view, you're walking in, to a radiology appointment, you're not expecting to go to theater, you're expecting to go home. 
Um, so it is a risk management, expectation management from, from a DGH point of view. You will not get me to core things unless I think it's a lymphoma. Um, but if if you have the capacity to core, core gives you an answer. But I don't know if we have pathologists who may or may not say that cytology is ever so slightly better for looking at thin preparations. But again, this is my understanding. Um, I will core things, which is not thyroid. Uh, I will core neck nodes, but getting me to core thyroid only if I have a ENT surgeon who's willing to take the patient to theater, if it happens. I've actually had a very funny conversation with an ENT surgeon about it, who says, no, 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 you should code, nothing will happen. <laughs> nope. Nope, thank you. Great, thank you very much. That's a wonderful talk, I think. Uh, I'll just get it out, take it out, yeah. Very nice.